What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, giving you your weekly look at what's going on in pop culture. My name is Pat Sheehan, joined by my co-host, the seven-time Super Bowl winning Tom Dave Martin Swagger Brady. What's going on, man? Hello. That's that's not how you want to start it, my friend. That's low blow. <laughs> ter- ter- uh, terrible occurrence once again. Antichrist yeah. has renewed his vows to Satan. And, and even more, uh, really boring game. Just like a yeah. terrible football game. Really all did around. suck. Um, Patrick Mahomes made some of the most incredible throws just that were just dropped. The best like, incompletions I've ever seen. Unbelievable. Um, but Dave, what we for a pop culture podcast, we don't talk sports here unless it's a, a special episode. So we're going to talk about the pop culture side of things. I, I don't think there's any real commercials to talk about. Pretty much a very like sentimental, low key commercial year. Yeah. But we had the weekend performing at the halftime um to to mixed reception i'd say uh, at least from what i've seen online how are you feeling about the weekend's performance yeah definitely a mixed reception i liked it quite a bit but that is certainly not the case for everyone and i think that really leads into expectations i think for most viewers although the uh, sound mix definitely wasn't superb this is a common theme with the super bowl halftime show unfortunately but uh abel's vocals were low and like the i feel it coming moment like the drums were really overpowering his vocals which is a shame because he was really singing he wasn't lip syncing yes there was a backing track there always is going to be one of those but he was singing Mm -hmm. and he was being drowned out by the production at times and that's really unfortunate and that's not his fault yeah it i think the stage setup and just the overall flow of it was really impressive. Like that beginning shot where he was like in the car and like the camera panned out as he walked. I was like, where are we even like, where is this happening on the field? It was so kind of disorienting. And then that huge like background where he had all the people with their faces wrapped and the choir with like the eyes. And it it was very, uh, very impressive. Kind of reminded me of uh, Kanye West's, um, tour after the the glow in the dark tour yeah no or the yeah. Jesus tour like Jesus with the tour. Yeah. yeah with the mass and like that animal that like hopped around just like a really like kind of chilling feeling and then opens up to this just very grand thing you know he runs into that golden like mirrored room all these right. look yes, like the heartless video yes uh came in that was really cool and then they're out in the field so i i thought the whole like technical setup was really good i agree with you on the the mixing wasn't great how did you feel about the song choices though i thought song choices were great uh i mean there was a lot of obvious ones he was definitely going to play Mm -hmm. uh star boy i i I, I thought blinding lights made sense as an intro because that production has like that long tail before Mm -hmm. he started singing but Starboy also makes sense in having Blinding Lights be the closer. Uh, pretty easy, I guess. It's the biggest song of 2020. Like, yeah. don't don't overthink it. But in addition to that, you know, we had what I feel it coming. I can't feel my face. You know, mm-hmm. major hits. Um, after hours, we only got one other song. Save your tears. I thought in your eyes was a pretty safe bet too. We didn't get a second one though, um, and. I, I couldn't help but laugh that on broadcast television, you had the weekend perform the Hills and earned it in particular <laughs> going long on earned it. Like in the beginning, yeah. it's a quick medley, like you, like usual, but he went long on earned it, which is if you we forget, you know, the song from the 50 shades soundtrack, mm-hmm. like most of his songs is a uh, pretty X rated and yep. the Hills is a song about having sex while you're high on Coke. Like, Mm-hmm. meanwhile you have like people dressed in like chorus robes singing background on these songs like oh it's really funny and i was like this is gonna piss some people off that are a little sensitive to that <laughs> and people were definitely pissed off and um you know unlike most super bowl halftime shows there weren't other guests even though drake and ariana grande had both been pretty heavily rumored beforehand um i mean when you think about the Super Bowl halftime show performances, for me, this is on the better side. You know, this is for the more recent ones. This is on like the Gaga side of it. I thought she was really good, but um, it's funny to see people be upset with, upset about it only because I don't really know what they were expecting to come right. out of this. 
and when he's and he's not a singer. Mm-hmm. He he never is a singer when he does his tours, so you can't expect you him mean to. A dancer. Yeah, uh, sorry, he's, he's not a dancer. Singer. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely a singer. He's only a singer. <laughs> He's not a dancer, so you can't expect him to be like Bruno Mars and Beyonce. He's not going to be on that level. That's fine. Um, so you have to kind of compare him to someone like Katy Perry, where it's like grand stage production matching with his, you know, slew of hits and, you know, bangers at that. And I think that's what we got. And I, and I liked how the production, you know, mix it up, both like camera angles, like when he did I feel it coming, he turns around, there's fireworks in the background, mm-hmm. uh, as you mentioned, like the indoor room for I can't feel my face, the blinding lights on the field at the end, like I thought they were switching it up uh, well, which is what they should be doing for someone who's not a dancer. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's like not necessary to have a special guest for the weekend because he has that many bangers. Mm-hmm. like i don't want to take away from him unless it's like someone equal of stature so i guess like ari or drake showing up would have been pretty wild mm-hmm. um man it would it would have been nuts if like drake came in and they did like crew love and like went way back but yeah. i don't know if that would have got like the <laughs> biggest populist hit because that's not like what people want to hear from drake right now you know like right but um and he's I mean, also let's be real drake should have a halftime show like, if yeah. they're ever going to pick a rapper, they'd pick someone like him who can, you know, do lots of low, low level, not really rap stuff, like one dance and hotline bling, right? Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure he's currently um, recovering, right? Didn't he like tear an ACL or something like that? Yes. Got hurt. So w- when I heard that rumor, I was like, I don't think there's a shot Drake shows up. I thought Ariana Grande, maybe like they do a duet together or something like that, but. Um, yeah, no, going, going back to your, your point, I do think someone like Drake, you know, or Jay-Z would probably be the two that come to mind. Jay-Z would never do it at this point. Yeah, it's, he's room, rumored to have turned it down multiple times at this point. Yeah. So Drake feels like the next one. Kanye is the only other one that I think has like the, the name brand, but at this point his, uh, his yeah, brand no ain't, ain't great. So, well, and that's the thing, like if it's not Drake and they've never done a full rap set before very few rappers even come in as guests so it's like it's tough to bank on that happening mm-hmm. Who who's next we talked about this before whenever we watched the halftime show but like there's not a lot of legacy acts left i think the legacy acts that are left are on the newer end like uh, like pearl jam Foo fighters like the biggest rock bands left yeah. there you did cold play but if, if not them and not drake then there's you know just a few pop singers left that's really all that's left of this caliber yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. I think they might need to start leaning into like the medley, getting like three or four different people who are performing like more recent popular songs, something that's right. friendly. <sighs> it's it's interesting to think about because you mentioned something like Foo Fighters and Pearl Jam. I don't know how far that reaches at this point, especially with younger people. You know, we're gonna talk about Foo Fighters in a second. I don't I don't think these songs are are reaching the teens at this point. So. And let's not Stuff. forget Red Hot Chili Peppers didn't get to do it by themselves. They came in support of Bruno. Coldplay right. didn't get to do it themselves. They had Beyonce and Bruno steal the show. So mm-hmm. they would definitely have guests if they ever picked Pearl Jam and Foo Fighters. That's not 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 up for debate. <laughs> totally. But like, yeah. I think Taylor Swift is probably the most exciting one on the mm-hmm. pop angle. Like I don't know if Ed Sheeran is is as exciting. Mm-hmm. And Bieber after that after changes, I don't think he's at, at the top of the list at this very moment. Yeah. I mean, you know, Rihanna comes to mind for me, but I, of she, she's on an interview saying she would never do it at this yeah, point. So man. yeah. NFL brand is, is tough for, I think some of these stars to get behind and, and rightfully so, um, but they are donating 250 million to end racism. So that's something. Yeah. <laughs> Ask Sean Watson about that. Dave, do you, Dave, do you think uh black country new road will ever perform the Super Bowl halftime show? <laughs> no way no yeah. way <laughs> yeah no way but uh they did they might go them. to one yeah i mean maybe they'll take like it to something yeah exactly um for the first time their debut album uh dropped and it was only six songs dave so you'd expect a nice short listen but uh that it is not it's a full-length album uh 40 minutes and it's quite the ride i'd say um before we get like too far into it did you enjoy this album I did. I did enjoy this album. It's uh, definitely a unique experience. Brought me back to some other uh, rock bands, but 
if, if, if new rock music can make you feel something a little different, that's a good sign in 2021. Yeah, and in, anyone that, that's watching on YouTube, if you see what this group looks like, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty nerdy looking people uh, from, from their pictures. But once you turn on the sound, the sound it goes pretty hard. And especially the vocal performance, I think will surprise you. It's like this like deep growl almost of a, a, a song of a like sound yeah, coming from Isaac register. Wood. Yeah. And uh, they really have this like cinematic quality to them. You know, they're, they are a big band. There's seven pieces and, you know, there's guitars, there's saxophone, there's heavy bass and drums throughout, but they also like work in these really beautiful like flourishes and swing se- uh, string sections that really make it feel kind of like, kind of reminds me of like james bond type feeling at some point you know like they are english that vibe right and i think the uh the band that first came to mind for me was black midi listening to them we've we reviewed their their debut album very exciting band coming out of the uk and just like a sound that you don't really hear and these people you know the new country black road or black country new road have the same sort of quality where you don't hear music like this made in in the states right now or at least not that's that's getting any sort of attention um and uh just as you kind of go through the the list every song sounds unique in its own sense which i think i find really interesting especially as you think about um i think we really give a lot of credit to albums that feel cohesive and even though this feels not incohesive i wouldn't say any of the tracks felt like they were necessarily like attached to each other to each other did you get that sense yeah well i think part of the appeal is that they're doing a lot of different genres Mm -hmm. and it it makes you feel different right and that's why i immediately thought of black mini too not that they're super uh, similar to black midi um I, i don't think black midi gets like as lighter on the instrumentation side as Black mm-hmm. Country New Road, but that same like feeling of like a having a unique experience while listening definitely brought me back. Um, I also thought of uh, Damon Albarn specifically mm. vocally at times. But that's the thing. At times, the album only six songs, but given how long these songs are and like how they have like second, third acts sometimes and long tails, like you're definitely going up and down with it. But I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, you know, um, I think both of those comparisons are, are ripe. And I, I also had like Carsey Headrest come to mind. I've seen Radiohead in terms of like the genre uh, bending kind of thrown out there. Um, you know, I think the one place I felt like maybe I couldn't always get into it was the lyrics. Um, you know, it, it's very specific type of lyrics where it's like constantly setting the scene and like making very like nuanced uh observations about this scene that they're setting up Mm -hmm. um but there were also some that really stood out to me like sunglasses i really liked how he kept coming back to like um like don't bring this into it don't bring my dad's job into this or leave kanye west out of this like those lines more than adequate yeah right yeah i thought were, were really good and like stuck out um i also really liked the song science fair a lot references references, references. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um i thought that was really great um and just kind of like that like feeling of dread all throughout science fair as he's like recounting this like awful experience he had um of like trying to impress this girl and then like setting her on fire at the science fair uh pretty funny um and then probably track x is the the standout for me um i don't know just feels so like the sound just feels so distinct and exciting it's it's nice to feel like there's something exciting coming out of rock music right now and a lot of it feels very samey and bland definitely definitely and you know i'm not plugged in enough to the scene to know but like maybe there's something to uh london rock right now between black midi and black country new road maybe there's a new subculture kicking up because American rock bands that are nascent. We're not saying this. Yeah, no, definitely not. So we're going to add probably one of their songs, uh, which is really like two songs onto our nostalgia best of 2021 playlist. So check that out on Spotify. Give it a follow. Share with your friends. Linked in the description of the show. And Haley Williams is our next review for today. 
flowers for vases. Uh, Descanos. Sorry, oh, I had to add the. <laughs> um, it's interesting because when we first started recording this show, Paramore had stopped making albums. You know, um, we kind of like, yeah, yeah. Where is Haley Williams and all this? And since since we've started Nostalgia, I think over the last like four years, we've gotten three Haley Williams albums. Uh, yeah. <laughs> two that I think we we both thought were pretty good, um, especially the Paramore album after laughter but hard do we, times do we feel like flowers for vases continues that streak for her well I, you know a surprise drop mm-hmm. we didn't know of his existence till but a few hours before it was out that's cool quarantine album from Haley williams uh recorded uh you know uh arranged completely by her in her mm-hmm. home in uh was it nashville i believe yep second album in less than a year as a result pals for armor her first solo album was largely recorded pre-pandemic not the case for the second solo album but you can tell early on that because this was a Haley williams solo joint full stop uh it is minimalist it is lo-fi it is acoustic and you know, I think her songwriting can still shine through song to song, but uh, from sound wise, this definitely had a hard time holding my attention. But that just speaks more to my personal taste. I still think it's well done. Yeah, I, I I'm similar in that this is a well made album. I think you can really hear the care that she put into this. She definitely strips back from the metaphor of pedals for armor, right? And I think that makes sense. You know, going, she kind of continues that flower metaphor. This feels very much like, like the Evermore to, um, you know, Petals for Armor's folklore in a sense sure. where she's really just like, this is my experience of my divorce um, and what it was like. I mean, she's likening losing part of her limb to the, the feeling of this breakup at, at parts. She's, talking about boxes being packed there's not as much metaphor on this which is it feels more personal but it also i think going with that stripped back acoustic sound on most of the tracks does leave it feeling a bit monotonous and and samey at times but still like the the production level especially uh you know the work of david james and uh carlos de la garza who are like the only two people she allowed to help her even put this together um I think really shines through in like very small moments, like on the first track, first thing to go, there's like a, a point when uh, there's like a harmony and then the tr- there's like a, almost like this like rush to the, the song and then it kind of falls back down. I just thought like the whole album is kind of filled with those things. Another song that really stands out to me over those hills has this very like country feel to it, but then it has this awesome, breakdown in the second half of the song that just like feels really like rocky and to like kind of pull those two sounds together so distinctly and it it felt almost kind of like Casey Musgraves in a sense like the way that that was put together so I I think there's some really nice parts of it but I do miss a lot of the things we got on Pedals for Armor like Cinnamon or Simmer, you know, those sorts of tracks. So, Well, Pedals for Armor definitely was trying to do a lot of different things. That did jump around a bit. This clearly by design is not trying to be that. Right. Um, And I think actually the moments where Haley lets it out just a little bit more is where I I think gravitate gravitate towards most on Flowers for Vases. I think uh, My Limb, Mm. still a simple song, but like because she's inflecting differently on the hook it like just stands out to me and feels more hard like my limb you know yeah. it's like then you yeah. know it's on like trigger and it's like wow that is just acoustic ass shit right there <laughs> <laughs> yeah trigger i mean even the the chorus like i had the trigger you had the gun um i was like ah okay like didn't totally work for me i actually really liked the last track to just the lover but i liked it because it's the least you know strip back song of the whole thing like there's heavy drums and synths and uh just feels like i wish we gotten a little bit more of that but 
you know, it's just nice to have Haley Williams in our lives right now. And even when it's like not really good from her, you've like, I would say this is not her best work. I think we're still getting really top notch stuff from overall. So cool. yeah, glad to have her back. Um, any last thoughts on Haley Williams? Or should we jump to the Foo Fighters? She's working just like the Foo Fighters. She's working. Uh, and Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins and the rest of the band are also working. Uh, Foo Fighters dropping their new album, Medicine at Midnight, follow up to their 2017 Concrete and Gold album, which we weren't big fans of from the Foo. Um, yeah, it's Foo Fighters are interesting. You know, you mentioned them as one of those legacy acts that you could see playing the Super Bowl eventually. And they, I would say, are probably guaranteed to play Super Bowl in the future at some point. Um, they feel like in the last five or six years, they've grown in uh, cultural status as we've seen Dave Grohl become more and more that like forebearer of, of rock. And yeah, I, I feel like that puts them in a very peculiar spot because what, what made, I think the Foo Fighters so fun and exciting was they, they kind of moved that nineties grunge sound into the 2000s rock mainstream pretty seamlessly you know everlong widely considered one of the greatest rock modern rock songs um you know they have a whole slew of songs from those early albums that just go and people know and you know uh, kind of regain popularity with things like rock band and guitar hero where people were like man these are just like fun to jam out to mm -hmm. um and now that they're they have this status, it's like, how do we maintain this and still be an interesting band? And did they find that recipe on medicine at midnight, uh, Dave? Well, that's the thing. It's like they know how to maintain that status. They make an album every few years and they tore the shit out of it. And because <laughs> oh. they're one of the biggest rock bands going, if not the biggest, besides like a band from the sixties, like they're right there at the top. Mm -hmm. um, they make a lot of money. It's very very successful for them, you know, to doing arenas. But they also, I don't think, have any real desire to think that far outside the box. This is their 10th album. You could probably say this about the last like, four, right? Like, they're just kind of doing a twist on what they've been doing lately. And, you know, all, all the promo, all the press about, um, uh, what's the album called? Medicine for Midnight? Medicine, Medicine at, at midnight. midnight. All the press about Medicine at Midnight is about how it's like they're dance album you know that they, they reunited with greg kirsten after concrete and gold but like this is just still them doing what they've been doing like it's really hilarious to hear them throw these other genres out and they're really not doing that at all like like well, the drums are still strong the right. guitars are still strong like it's the same stuff you know yeah i mean i th i think you do hear them experimenting with some things that they ha haven't done a lot of in the past like making a fire that first song really is like a i don't know like throwback to like trying to be like 70s rock in a sense you know yes, like yes. with the the female vocalist in the background with the na na na's and the like almost kind of like it feels like deep purplish type sound in a sense <laughs> um and then and then it kind of switches up when for the title track miss at midnight which is a total like talking heads david bowie like trying to be like a 80s dance song riff mm -hmm. um but they, they can't really help themselves. They get to the chorus and Dave Grohl just does his like usual scream and it's back to just being a Foo Fighter song. And like, oh, well, they, they, they tried for like half a song to like yeah. maintain this, which, you know, good for them. Like, do your Bowie impression, Dave Grohl. Like, I'm, I'm here for it. I'll listen to it. Um, yeah, well, but the rest of it felt pretty piece. Right. Well, and that's the thing for me is I'm not like a huge Foo Fighters fan. So mm -hmm. I don't have like a, a lot to like re refer back to and they're like best stuff. So when I hear stuff like uh, Making a Fire and uh, Shame, Shame and Son mm -hmm. of Mine and and uh, Holding Poison as well, I'm like, oh, this shit rips. Yeah. This shit's hard. Hold I like this. This is good. Yeah. Holding the now, I don't think really it's anything, probably not anything special to like a real Foo Fighters fan. But mm -hmm. to me, that rips and that's unlike most rock I listen to that's new. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'll take that. That's good enough for me. But it may not be good enough for a hardcore fan, but I don't know if they actually care anymore. 
you already have all those touchstones. Do you mind if right. your tenth album isn't that great? Like everyone's tenth <laughs> album isn't that great. Right. No, that I think that's a really good point, and I actually think this is the best album they've had in quite some time. Um, you know, just kind of like running through the albums that they've had. Sonic like, Highways. Sonic Highways, Big Dud. Um, in, in my opinion, I think there's some good stuff on there, and I like how they were trying to like pull all these genres from across the country in, but I don't think it really was worked that well before that wasting light had one or two tracks. I think that really stood out. Um, but then it, you know, it, it really gets back to like 2007 echo silence, patience and grace from the last time they had a real album that I think stood out to people, you know, you have songs like the pretender on there, which was, you know, like a, top 100 darling that summer um so it's it's strange to just think that they haven't really like had a major hit and at this point it's kind of like can we find one or two songs on these albums that we can throw into like the the arena set list you know and and i think i think they did that i think there's three or four songs on here you mentioned holding the poison that's probably the best song um to me like that that groove is just really really fun at the chorus and then you get a bunch of like solos on it, you know, guitar solos, drum solos. So it sounds great. Um, no Son of Mine is like a Queens of the Stone Age type sounding song, which I'm like, cool, go for it. Um, and yeah, we already mentioned the other two. So I think there's enough on here for even hardcore fans to be like, yeah, this is pretty good. So and, that, and for Foo Fighters at this point, I, th- I think that's a win. The one interesting thing though is this was recorded pre-COVID I mean they were supposed to be headlining Boston Calling along with Rage Against the Machine and the Chili Peppers this past right. um, September or August whenever they, they hold it or is, are they earlier? It's Memorial Day usually isn't Memorial it? Day right yeah. they, they do a second one in the fall but yeah it's Memorial Day so they were supposed to be you know dropping this and uh, touring at this point so I'm, I'm interested to see how much run they get off this album before uh, you know people kind of forget about it and move on to whatever's next. I'm, I'm assuming we probably get a Rage album at some point in the future. Oh, I'm, I'm assuming we're probably going to get a... They had already rejoined, but My Chemical Romance album, so that will probably draw some attention away. So. Yeah, 2020 definitely sapped that away. Forgot yeah, about that. For sure. So there's, there's some things that will probably come back once things are happening again, but I don't know if this album's going to get a, a long run to it. We'll see. Um, I know I talked a lot during this. Any last thoughts for this album? No, I, I liked it more than I expected to. Yeah, you know, there's some songs that hit, no doubt. Dave Grohl's still great. Like him a lot. Uh, Nostalgia Best 2021 on Spotify. Check the, the show notes on whatever platform you're watching on. Let's move on to Studio Ghibli dropping their first non-hand-drawn uh, animation film. Uh, Earwig and the Witch. Mm-hmm. Dave, you are, I would say, the Studio Ghibli expert, bigger fan out of the two of us. I, I know them. I, I know the style. I have not watched the movies. How are you feeling about this Earwig and the Witch movie? Not good. Oh, no. Not good, man. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, the first time they did 3D computer animation. And did not go well. This is definitely definitely the worst Studio Ghibli movie I've seen. I have not seen all of them. I haven't even seen most of them. But every one I've seen, I've liked. And I think, as you said, the reputation precedes them as just a you know landmark animation house that has a long storied uh, history dating back to the eighties. And you know, this one, Irig and the Witch, was directed by Goro Miyazaki, the son. Of Hayao Miyazaki, one of the founders, the, of course, creator of the most celebrated Studio Ghibli films and the most successful ones. Um, everyone knows the hits, I have to imagine. Spirited Away would be the biggest of them all. But this is the first Studio Ghibli movie that's come out since we've been doing the podcast. And I thought it was quite notable. You know, I mean, the last one came out in 2014. And then at that point, the studio closed because Hayao Miyazaki had uh, retired. And then a few years later, it reopened because he said he was really bored (laughs) with retirement and he's making um, 
everyone assumes one final film uh called how do you live which is expected to come out in 2023 uh he's still hand drawing it uh with with the team but he used to make about 10 minutes of animation a month he says now he's only making about one minute so the movie is just taking a long time he started in 2016 um but that's obviously quite exciting but in the meantime this is what we've gotten out of studio jubilee since they reopened um and goro uh he's two movies before this tales from earth sea and from up on poppy hill he's like one for two with that so to have this one like i think he's like kind of like a pariah at this point for studio ghibli fans but it, it's quite a i think a, a disappointing uh return for the studio because um they're riding such good momentum too it's like hayo's back making a final masterpiece really exciting right mm-hmm. and the, the other founder uh takahata his last movie tales of prince the tale of princess kaguya came out in like 2013 beloved 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 lost the oscar to big hero six that has not aged well he has since passed so it's like there needs to be like a future path for studio ghibli right because hayo is making one movie and he's probably done because he's 80 um what's left what's next and i don't think this is a uh uh, a good sign (laughs) at least for goro i don't know because you know this is adapted from a novel by Diana Wynne Jones. Not the first time they've adapted stuff to Ujibu, but not everything is 100% original. And that author also wrote Howl's Moving Castle, which was adapted into one of the best Studio Ghibli films. So it's like, I, I, there's a lot that went wrong, clearly. We can get to that in a second. And to me, it, it's just really frustrating because I feel like a lot of people have been getting into the Studio Ghibli movies for the first time because they, for the first time, became available on streaming in 2020 on HBO Max, they had not been streamable at all up until that point. That was kind of like a big sticking point for the studios. They were more fans of like programming it. Like there would be uh, yearly runs where they would should be like in the theaters for a weekend, some movies and the Blu-ray sales were obviously a big part of this as well. So like we're definitely in a new stage for the studio, right? And like the access is there. And I'd say stick to HBO Max where you watch Eerie and the Witch don't watch this if you somehow didn't see it already and watch the good shit. It's all there. It's finally easy to watch. Mm. Um, and I just hope they can learn from this. What Whether they stick the 3D or not versus hand-drawn, I'm not going to be a big stickler about it because I know like how expensive and time-consuming it is to make stuff hand-drawn. Mm. But like, man, like you think of the aesthetic of the hand-drawn animation and like it's so full of life and wonder and so rich and... Mm. Irrigan the Witch, like, I think it's animated okay, but, like, it does not feel super rich. And then when you have this story that's really light on plot, um, it, it, it's quite the big miss. But how do you feel about someone who's not uh, invested in the studio? Yeah, so I found the film to be pretty uninspired in terms of the overall story, um, but not not to the point where I was like, this is really bad i just was like you know this seems like a kid's movie like they're trying to like make it just interesting enough where like a kid will be invested and there's fun stuff happening but maybe not like super intense where like an adult is like oh like that's that's interesting or i'm really captivated by that kind of like dick pixar really um is able to thread that needle a lot we talk about that i think i was more taken aback by the clunkiness of some of the animation at points like sometimes the way people would take steps or walk or like start to stand in place i just felt like was not done super well which i was like huh i i didn't expect that i was expecting the animation to be pretty flawless but probably should have recognized that this is their first attempt at this sort of animation so it's not going to be you know 100 out of 100 um i i do think the characters looked really cool and like um i love like the flowy like witches like hair and those colors i i thought like when the when the mandrake would get really mad and like when he became like that huge like hulking devil like character i thought that was done pretty good like so there were some things i was like this is pretty interesting um i'm actually really intrigued to see the second film because i feel like i'm way more interested in earwig's mom than anything else i just want to learn more (laughs) so i'm i'm interested to like probably get that part of the story than this part 
Well, and that was what's so weird because like it sets up with like this whole backstory about why she's like running and yeah. has to leave your wig at the orphanage and that is completely abandoned. Like it's like mm-hmm. made up backstory as if it didn't even happen. Like and that that was the thing for me with the movie. It's like I can ignore the animation. No, it's not a problem, but like I had a hard time like wrapping my head around what like the central conflict was. Right. Yeah. Your it's wig like these people are like antagonists but they're not like yeah yeah. and it's like that's the thing it's like there's lots of stuff in studio ghibli where it's like smaller scale not everything's like super grand like princess mononoke it doesn't have to be like that but like i I just found it kind of unfocused and was having a hard time trying like latch on to like what i'm supposed to be learning what journey is supposed to be on you know so yeah i guess like it's a meta criticism because i'm comparing it to like more richer narratives from the past from studio ghibli but Sure. Well, yeah, that's a good point. I think the conflict that they kind of came back to at the end was like, how does Earwig take control, uh, you know, of of whatever place she's in? And the tension was that she wasn't able to do that. But then, then she she figured it out by the end. Um, and then I guess like the next conflict is going to be making sense of her mom being there. But I don't know what's going to come of that. Uh, notable, um, some great voice actors in this you know richard e grant is uh yep. the man drake dan stevens is her friend thomas um yeah. a lot of more of him as the cat yeah casey musgraves um is the the mom so i'm like again I'm, barely I'm in. though she's barely in it right i'm in though let me uh let me hear these people voice act so hopefully yeah. we'll get some more of that in a second film i want to hear more of what you didn't like though because I, I can tell that you're pretty disappointed with this I say in general they do a good job with like the dubbing English voice cast member. Uh, Christian Bale is in a uh, Howl's Moon Castle, I believe, and Shia LaBeouf, young Shia LaBeouf, was in one of them. Like they they always get good talent to do the English dubbing. Um, but yeah, no, I think for me it was just like the story story didn't grab me, and like I feel like the like that kind of like whimsy you can expect from like smaller scale Ghibli stories. Uh, I just didn't have, and maybe maybe if the animation was hand drawn, maybe I, I I would have been more forgiving. But for whatever reason, I just had a hard time like connecting, mm-hmm. connecting with it. Like every time, like they're in the uh, the witch's like lab brewing yeah. area, I'm like waiting for like some like sparks, and I just didn't, didn't feel like I was getting them. Like as a kids' movie, you know, I, I'm sure kids are entertained watching Earwig, you know, mm-hmm. have fun and like torment these these older people and stuff (laughs) like it it's all good fun but yeah i think like thematically i just kind of was thinking it would be richer than it was yeah yeah it 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 was only uh what 80 minutes or yeah it was short that it was short so it seems like they're setting up for maybe a couple of movies attached to this in the long run we'll see and that would be interesting too if studio ghibli increased their output to that degree because as of right now we only know of the one i was working on we don't know of any other projects so right. that'd be interesting we'll see how it goes uh earwig and the witch maybe don't check it out but watch the other studio ghibli movies yeah, you, you can do better do watch malcolm and marie though on netflix the sam levinson uh pandemic conceptualized and created and filmed and shot movie uh starring only two characters and diane John David Washington, two people we like a lot. Um, mm-hmm. You know, black and white movie. I think that's a, a bit awards baby has been the word thrown around on it. Um, and, you know, I, I think I can agree. But uh, I will say the one thing I came away from this movie is it's beautifully shot and like very aesthetically pleasing to look at the whole time. I, I thought mm-hmm. that was probably my favorite part. Um there's some things I don't think I like so much and we'll talk about that. But Dave, how are you feeling about Malcolm and Marie? Yeah, I liked it. It's definitely unique, has a lot going on. A lot, (laughs) a lot has happening with the discourse of this movie in a short time. No question. Um, But I did like it. Even if it's challenging, a lot of people don't like it at all. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's sitting at 53% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I think if if you had told me that on Friday, I would have expected the movie to just be really bad. And I don't think the movie's bad at all. Like, I think it's like, 
I, th- I think the performances are, are pretty good. Um, I think Zendaya much better than John David Washington, in my opinion. Um, I think that's also kind of the characters in this movie. You know, a lot of dialogue. Yeah, it's it's heavy um, in terms of like it's like two people kind of going around the ring and just like throwing punches nonstop. It's it, and th- there's one part. I think it's near the end. I think you might say a couple times where Malcolm goes, "You're exhausting," and I just was like, "This movie is exhausting." Like, I, I'm my, my brain is tired listening to you two go back and forth all night. Were you feeling the same way? Yeah, 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 it's tough. And you could tell, like, John David Washington, I feel like he just kind of settled on that one gear for yeah. his performance. I, like, I like I, I like it. Like, he's he's just has movie star qualities. Like, Zendaya, oh, yeah. you just like looking at him and watching him speak and do mm-hmm. things and walk around. But, like, you could tell, like, he was having trouble, like, keeping up with the dialogue. And, like, you know, I mean... you the meta nature of the film deleting that into the, the reception is interesting to think about because this was like a really buzzy thing it's like oh they shut down euphoria season two production like everything else sam levinson made a whole new script and filmed a secret covid movie in two weeks with a 20 person crew and he made it with johnny watching zendaya wow the netflix is like wow here's 30 million like we'll we'll run this for oscars and it's like oh wow like it it was all gearing up and like all this mystique right and then fast forward and it's kind of like the mystique about his uh second movie that came out in 2018 assassination nation buzzy movie big sundance sell Mm -hmm. and then kind of the mixed reception you know and it's weird to see like the like Sam Levinson kind of get raked over the coals again because how how warmly Euphoria has been received, especially the Euphoria specials, which were also concocted during COVID. Like you can tell he's really like interested in like thinking outside the box with all kinds of stuff. But I feel like there's just like a few too many times he like pokes the bear when when he made this movie that just kind of annoys people, whether it's the script whether it's the acting, the casting decisions, or just the kinds of needling about like the act of criticism, because meta wise, Levinson has an interesting relationship to criticism that he's had through his career. And you hear him, you know, rag on the white lady at the LA times. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's John Day Washington saying it, but it's all Sam's words. And it's, you can, I can tell why it would turn some people off. In addition to the movie, being exhausting to watch even if you're enjoying it just by the nature of it not having any ancillary parts but besides two characters speaking in this one place yeah and and it's not even like i I think it would feel less exhausting if they actually like gave into the tension of just like also wanting to like be with each other because there's there's certain parts where it feels like they're about to like have sex or at least like just be intimate and then one of them will be like, I have to go to the bathroom. You know, Malcolm gets up to go to the bathroom. Like, don't, don't move a muscle. Just stay exactly like so this. I'm enjoying thing. this. Right. And then he comes back and, and Zendaya has, has her, her armor back on, ready to fight again. It's just like, man, like it, it, you never really get a break in this movie from the, the battle. And it, it's a really tough battle to sit with because they're incredibly cutting. Like I, I I walked away from this movie and I was like, I don't know if I if I fight the way normal people fight, because when I get in arguments with like the, the people I care about in my life, I never am this mean. Like, I don't think I've ever been as mean as they are to each other in my entire life to anybody. Yeah. But they're they're brutal, man. And it's it's yeah. tough. Definitely. Definitely. Um, uh, you know, another piece of criticism would be that uh, Levinson as a sole writer for the script is writing for black characters and not only writing black characters, but speaking to the black experience as like black creatives, right? And Malcolm, um, his identity as a black director is like a big part of that LA times review that really sets him off. Right? Like it's, it's a kind of consistent theme throughout the film. And he says that Zendaya and JDW were collaborative in that script. You know, I, I, don't know if I can speak about it as eloquently as some black critics have been, but I can understand obviously why that's a sticking point. One though that I kind of push back on a little bit is the age gap between the casting. Uh, John David Washington, a new performer, but 
in his mid thirties. Zendaya is what, 22, 24, whatever it is. Yeah. Very young. It's an over 10 year gap. Now I was thinking about that. Like I, I knew he was a little older, but for whatever reason, it, it, it kind of sat okay with me because this is only John Day Washington's like third lead performance. It's Zendaya's first. He feels like a new performer still, even though he's older. And he actually said in press that Zendaya is more experienced in the industry than he is. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I, I understand like it's a symptom of Hollywood where it's really hard for older women to be cast yeah. in stuff. No question. But I kind of just, I think I just view like John Day Washington as a younger actor than he actually is because he's still relatively new in his career. But yeah, I, I agree with that. But I, I also was thinking uh, having the characters played by these actors who are, I, I mean, like you mentioned, Zendaya isn't necessarily like a newbie to the industry at all. But, you know, I, I think just kind of starting to really hit her stride in terms of like dramatic work and getting more and more feature roles. I wonder if this movie could have been served by having some more seasoned people playing these roles. And it, but I come up short in thinking about who would be a good person to step in there. You know, like if you want to keep both the characters as black characters, then, um, you know, like Regina King came to mind. Cause I feel like there's like some nuance to that character, but she feels a little too old. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think who would be kind of in that range of, of like maybe like mid thirties, female and male actors who have, in the business and could flesh out these characters to a bit more of a degree because like you also said washington he never comes down from from 11 uh, on the dial and it feels like there are just some moments where he could have hit home more emotionally if he wasn't just constantly like berating but that also might be how levinson wanted him to play the character i don't know it's it's tough I, i'm not sure how to improve the movie with through the acting but it feels like there's something to be desired there i guess well and i think you know i think that's just kind of the, the you, it should all just flow back to the script right like this was a, right. a quickly conceived script that has very little else going on it's this argument rambling argument between mm-hmm. two people where they take turns dressing each other down but also speaking to like greater societal issues through their own experience like it's trying to be quite heady and i don't think it it, it it's definitely not as intelligent as, as it thinks it is unfortunately and yeah. that kind of colors the performance and the you know the quality of the film as a result but i think i was just kind of struck with how unique it still felt to me like yeah black and white not anything new right right but that with like the unique setting, this is the Caterpillar house in Carmel, California. It's a famous home. Mm-hmm. And actually, apparently it was chosen as the filming location because in that municipality in California, filming permits weren't required. So he basically could get away with making this movie during COVID. And I was like, oh, wow, that's like incredibly convenient that yeah. it made logistical sense to shoot at this really aesthetically pleasing home. Cool. Mm-hmm. But like you have that cool home, and because we never leave it, you know, you pan around. Like I really like that one shot when they're looking through the windows of like the bedroom and stuff. Like that with the black and white, and just like how like I you know, like debonair the they, they, the two actors look because they're just yeah. coming back from this film premiere. They look great. Like it's like I don't know. Like I'm I'm with this still, but yeah, yeah. I feel like thematically a lot of people have serious issues with it, and I totally understand. But yeah. I was still kind of entertained, even though it, it, it is it is tough to watch at times, no question. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was definitely entertained. And I, I was thinking more just about like some of the technical choices. And, and I think there was some really not things I didn't like so much. I thought the music choices were really great songs, but I think almost like too on the nose at times <laughs> for what you know the, the times they were being played and what they were trying to say Rick but James when the beginning was pretty sick yeah that was, that was great and the the vocals on there are just so crisp and loud it's just really really fun um but I really liked how he used like the different spaces of the house and like that that to like kind of symbolize different 
things going on for each character or or like there's that scene where i think malcolm's outside drinking and you see some but it's like a close-up on zendaya on the other side of the screen like smoking a cigarette in a totally different part of the house and how they're both like kind of going through, the, through these things but like mm-hmm. outdoors and like experience what they're experiencing you can kind of see in both i thought that was brilliantly done um like having marie like go missing at that point in the movie and then john david washington like go out and like something after her i was like this is like a really yeah. good way to kind of like capture this like dynamic where she'll like try to like get away from him and he's like yeah. constantly after her and even when she's just like trying to like go pee like it's i thought it was like really brilliantly done in some some respect right. so yeah i i, I really enjoyed the scene with the uh, the knife that ends in yeah. the double birds i thought that was really well played and that is probably <laughs> one of her best moments in the film yeah and I mean, that that that's actually another meta moment because it's playing on our relationship with Zendaya. Her best role, of course, is Rue on Euphoria, which is a very similar character um, in terms of substance abuse things and stuff. So it's like kind of playing on uh, your past relationship with Levinson and Zendaya. Um, I think if, if one one moment that I really enjoyed in one of the many rambling moments from Malcolm, I liked how he really, and this is really just, it's Levinson's voice box, obviously, but like I really enjoyed the comment about um criticism that like just kind of picks apart the choices made and suggests hypothetical alternatives versus actually just judging what was done. And I'm like, oh, I really like that. I agree with that. I think that you know that's like really hacky criticism. We all do it. We we certainly do it too. But I think that's a really good point. Like, yeah. like uh, and I, I liked hearing that. And that's some of his other points maybe mm-hmm. aren't the best points, you know, or it's kind of like really like dramatic, but that yeah. one I think really stuck with me in terms of like, cause the, to- the topic of criticism comes stay- stays a topic in the film much longer than I expected. I knew it was going to be in there at some point. I didn't know it was going to be this prevalent, but yeah. I did enjoy that moment. No, I, I, I think there's a, a lot to like about the movie. I think the criticisms are fair though. And, um, Overall, I'm just grateful we got this movie. Um, you know, yeah. kind of given the it's circumstances, cool. how it's brought about. Um, I love seeing those two actors together. Um, I hope we we get to see them act and other things together too, because I, th- I feel like they they definitely are at each other's level for sure. So, um, last question for you on the movie, Dave: um, Do you eat your craft macaroni and cheese like that, like a savage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a loud eater, huh? yeah it's really shoveling I, it in i saw one review that was like taking it the other way and it's like marie doesn't need to be as dramatic about making box macaroni and cheese like that's true you're not like, slaving at the stove like no. relax girl <laughs> yeah I, I think it was just like and yeah. another thing at that point but yeah um all right we're gonna wrap up there what do we got for next week yeah i just wanted to measure real quick um oh. sam levinson i was looking at his stuff we know euphoria season two is in progress uh, we'll, we'll get it when we get it. He also has a screenplay credit on Deep Water, which is the Adrian Lyne movie coming out later this year, which is where Ben Affleck and Anda Armas met. Yeah. I was like, huh, I, I wonder what he brings to that movie. Interesting. So we'll find out in time. Uh, you mean Ben Affleck, the uh, Critics' Choice Award uh, nominee for the Way Back for the Best Actor. Did you see the Way Back yet? I did. It's not bad. Yeah. He's pretty I enjoyed good. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I liked it. That was one of the last movies I saw in the theaters pre COVID. It's on, it's on HBO Max if anyone wants to check it out. Yeah, check it out. What we got for next week? Uh, so we got the Slow Tie sophomore album, Tyron. Excited about that. Um, we got To All the Boys I Love Before Three. Yeah. I'm less mean, excited about that. Why not? <laughs> uh, there's some VOD movies we'll be looking at like the recent release uh, falling with Vigo mortensen and um there's this other one i i what's it called uh breaking news in yuba county which has alice and janney and mila kunis and a whole litany of other people it looks pretty cool um also uh shung ha from 88 rising is releasing her debut album so okay we got we got some stuff no question We'll be talking about it all and more. So stay tuned and we'll see you next week.